If someone has type 2 diabetes or they're pre-diabetic and they haven't got much advice other than to cut their calories and exercise more, then keep watching because if you haven't heard the news, pre-diabetes and for that matter, type 2 diabetes are reversible as proven by countless studies. But just eating less and moving more, although it sounds easy enough, doesn't work for most of the people most of the time. Exercise certainly plays an important part in restoring the body's ability to manage its blood sugar levels naturally. And the timing of exercise can also be key. But when it comes to calories, we now know that it's not so much the quantity of calories, but the quality of calories that makes the most difference. And it turns out that even more key is the timing of those calories. And this is where intermittent fasting can be used to reverse prediabetes and put type 2 diabetes into remission, which is the subject of this video. So how does this condition develop? Well, prediabetes comes first, which is when the cells in our body gradually become resistant to insulin, the hormone responsible for lowering our blood sugar after we eat food. This hormone is produced by our pancreas, and when our cells become resistant to it, our blood sugar levels gradually creep up, and the pancreas has to produce even more insulin to get the job done. And the cells, being exposed to high levels of insulin, start to tune out to its effects, and it becomes a vicious cycle until eventually, no matter how much insulin the pancreas makes, blood sugar levels stay consistently high. And that's called type 2 diabetes. So when we talk about reversing diabetes and putting it into remission, what we need to think about is eating in a way that keeps our insulin levels low most of the time. And in this way, our cells can become resensitized to the effects of insulin so that blood sugar levels can once again be controlled naturally and the pancreas doesn't have to work so hard. So the question is, how do we keep our insulin levels low? And this raises another question. Which foods elevate insulin the most? Well, carbohydrates create the biggest spike to insulin because they have the biggest impact on blood sugar, especially starchy carbs and refined carbs like those we find in ultra-processed food. Foods high in protein have some effect on insulin, but not nearly as much as carbs. And foods high in fat barely move the insulin needle. So from this angle, considering that insulin resistance underpins prediabetes and type 2 diabetes, and carbs are the biggest driver of high blood sugar and high insulin, you could also look at prediabetes and type 2 diabetes as an extreme intolerance to carbs. And one solution is to restrict carbs to such a level that our blood glucose and our insulin stays relatively low most of the time. And this is the premise behind ketogenic diets, which are typically high in fat and very low in carbs. And there's a lot of evidence that ketogenic diets can be leveraged to reverse insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. But what about fasting? We've known about the power of fasting to heal the body for thousands of years, and fasting has many health benefits. Apart from inducing weight loss, fasting has been shown to improve mental clarity and concentration, increase energy, improve immunity, lower cholesterol, decrease inflammation, prevent Alzheimer's disease, reverse the aging process, and actually extend life. But when we look at diabetes, the benefit of fasting is lower blood sugar levels, lower insulin production, and improved insulin sensitivity. Now, there are all sorts of ways to fast, ranging from a simple 12-hour overnight fast, which most people do without even thinking they're fasting, to prolonged fasts that can last a whole day or several days or even weeks. There's alternate day fasting where you fast every other day. You can fast once a week or once a month or even once a year for that matter. And the shorter the fasting period, the more frequently it can be done. There's no best way to fast because it really depends on the individual. Needless to say though, the longer someone fasts, the more important it is to be safe. And depending on your health circumstances, it might be a good idea to check with your healthcare professional first, especially if you're considering a prolonged fast of more than a day or two. But that all said, these days, the most popular form of fasting is called intermittent fasting, which simply means that periods of fasting take place regularly between periods of normal eating. And because it's typically a shorter duration, people find they can fit it into their routine much more easily. Examples might be the popular 5-2 diet, which is when we eat normally on five days of the week and we significantly reduce our calories by as much as 80% for two days during the week. 
There's also what is called time-restricted feeding. And this is when we consume all of our food within a compressed window of time. For example, a 12-hour fast also means a 12-hour feeding window. So if you take in your last calories of the day at, say, 8 p.m., that would mean you don't break fast until 8 a.m. But as you start compressing your eating window further, you're gradually extending your overnight fast to, say, a 14, a 16, or even a 20-hour fast. But let's take a 16-hour fast as an example. You might call this a 16-8, where in a 24-hour period, you're fasting for 16 of those hours, and all of your eating is within an 8-hour window. So that might look like taking your last bite of food at 8 p.m. and not breaking fast the next day until 12 noon, basically skipping breakfast. The health benefits come from making less insulin each day, giving your cells a chance to become more responsive to it, and giving your pancreas a bit of a breather at the same time. It might take some time to build up to a 16-8 intermittent fast, but the more you do it, the easier it gets as your appetite adapts and your body learns how to tap into its own body fat when you're not eating. And the subject of intermittent fasting for weight loss is a great one, but we'll park that for another day and stick to type 2 diabetes. Now, we can go two steps further if we want to maximize the opportunity to reverse type 2 diabetes. The first step is making sure that our meals are balanced and based more around protein and healthy fats, which don't drive up insulin as much, and that we minimize starchy and refined carbs, which cause big spikes in blood sugar and insulin, and even bigger spikes in those that are diabetic. The second step is to eat no more than three times a day. So if you're adopting a 16-hour fast and eating three meals, those meals would be spaced around four hours apart, let's say 10, 2, and 6. But the key is no snacking in between. Keep in mind that every time we eat, even if it's just a snack, we make insulin. And for this reason, we have a much better chance of reversing diabetes if we eat larger meals less frequently than if we consume the same amount of food but spread across the day. And the studies also back this up. One study showed that mice that were fed over a 24-hour period have much more belly fat and signs of insulin resistance than mice that were fed the same amount of food but only during an 8-hour feeding window. Now, I should emphasize that there are some groups of people that should not consider fasting, especially the more prolonged fasts. I'm talking about children under 18 who need nutrients for growth, women who are pregnant or breastfeeding, individuals who are malnourished or seriously underweight, and people diagnosed with type 1 diabetes who require regular insulin injections. It really isn't safe for any of those groups to fast. And individuals diagnosed with type 2 diabetes who are taking medications to lower blood sugar should of course consult with their doctor before embarking on a fasting program. This is primarily because fasting lowers blood glucose significantly, and medications that also work on blood sugar could then drive blood glucose dangerously low unless the dosage is adjusted. And this is where you'd want to monitor your blood sugar levels regularly while fasting. There are also other conditions and some other medications that have to be taken with food that might also mean that fasting is not an option. So always check with your healthcare professional. But for those that don't fit into any of those categories, your body is more than capable of adapting to short periods without food. And it can maintain sufficient blood glucose levels just by burning body fat. After all, when we're pre-diabetic, it basically means our body is gradually losing its ability to burn its own body fat for energy and regular fasting can help to reverse that trend. So give intermittent fasting a try and let us know how you get on. For more information on fasting and other ways to optimize health, check out some of our courses by visiting our website. Link in the description below. If you're not sure if you're pre-diabetic and you have some concerns, check out the video coming up next where we look at some of the top signs and symptoms of pre-diabetes. Until next time, you take care.